On behalf of the Olathe Public Schools, welcome to this educational session. These events are provided once per quarter and are sponsored by the Olathe Public Schools Foundation. My name is Angie Salava, and I am the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Mental Health Services for the Olathe Public Schools. I'm excited to introduce tonight's topic, Practical Strategies for Changing the Behavior Dynamic at Home. Our presenters are some of the district's behavior experts, and they have some great tips for helping you teach some of the behaviors you want to see in your home, whether your child is in preschool or a senior in high school. Tonight's presenters are Dr. Scott Fluke, who is the leader of this team as the Positive Behavior Intervention Supports, or PBIS coordinator, and three of the coaches on the team, Tana Arnold, Dr. Anne-Marie Bixler-Funk, and Tom Hankin. This team works with teams of teachers to support student behavior and to create the best possible environment for student learning. Thank you for viewing, and I will now turn it over to the PBIS team. Thank you, Angie. I'm Dr. Anne-Marie Bixler-Funk, a PBIS coach for Olathe Public Schools. While I've worked in education for 28 years in various levels, my role tonight comes to you as a stepmother, an aunt, and a wife. At some point or another, I have had to utilize all the strategies presented this evening to support the people I love with the goal of improving my personal relationships. Believe me, in these strategies, when things are really stressful, it can be difficult. But the reality is, if you use them, they work. With that in mind, let's take a look at the comment presented in this slide. In what ways does it resonate with you? Like, can you think about a time where you were the adult in this situation? Maybe you were the adult in this situation and in public? Maybe you witnessed a similar scenario. Or maybe you were out shopping and you saw teens aimlessly wandering around and wondered who's teaching them what they should be doing and how they should be behaving. It's difficult to be the adult when this behavior is happening around you as you don't want to be judged, and it's super easy to be the one who's judging others when you see it happen. Um, has that thought ever come into your mind? Why can't they manage their children? So here's the thing, and this is important for all of us to remember. It always feels worse when it's your child, mostly because it's happening to you. You're in that moment. One of the things I try to remember and that I think about in working with parents and even in thinking about my own parents, as parents, we can only do what we know how to do at any given moment. This is true for every one of us as we're learning this on the fly. So it's important that we give ourselves grace and opportunities to learn. So with that learning, let's think about the goals that we have for this presentation this evening. We're hoping to provide you with an understanding of why behavior happens. We're gonna provide you strategies to teach the behavior you wanna see so that positive behaviors turn into habits. Then we also want to give you some strategies for what to do when challenging behavior occurs because we know our kids aren't always going to behave the way we want them to. And then in addition, we're going to need some strategies to troubleshoot when things aren't working the way we want them to work. So let's talk about teaching behavior. We need to decide what are the behaviors we want to see in our children. So with that, here's what we know for sure. We know our kids, right? We know how they're going to behave. We know their moods. We can predict how they will behave in certain scenarios. And when, when we're thinking about running errands or going to certain places, we want to think about how will our children behave. So, for example, our toddler might want to visit the toy section. Or maybe our teenagers want to go to see what new video games are in so that they can have for those super expensive systems that they play their games on. Anyway, the point is, is that we want to think about teaching the behaviors. So before we go to Target, we might want to talk about what behaviors are expected. This is being proactive. When we are proactive and we give our children the expectations, we are setting them up for success, and then we have time to respond positively rather than react to the behaviors we do not want to see. So why are we teaching behaviors? How many times have you said to your child, you should know better? You should have known better. Why did you do that? So think about it. Should your children really have known better? 
Have you really taught them what's expected with specific behavior? The only way we can be sure children should know better is to teach them what we expect. We cannot assume that children just get behavior through certain experiences. In fact, what we need to assume is that children need to be taught expectations and rules. And with that teaching, they need to practice the appropriate behaviors. I like to think about this in the same terms that I might think about teaching someone to read. We know that when kids are given opportunities to read, maybe they reread a book over and over again, they have practice so that they get better. This is the same with behavior. If we give them multiple opportunities to practice, it provides routine towards the behaviors we expect them to see. So I wanna teach behaviors, how am I gonna do that? This is very easy. It's really a four-step process. We might wanna think about defining the behavior, modeling the behavior, practicing the behavior, and then providing feedback. So I would invite you to consider this. You've probably been out shopping and you've seen those signs. I know I've seen them everywhere. You see them on Pinterest, you see them on Etsy. In this family, we love, we laugh, we forgive, we have fun, we work hard kind of a family mantra, right? So I would invite you to think about sitting with your family and determining what are the behaviors that you expect in your behavior, or in your family. Maybe what you decide is you sit down as a family and you decide, you know what? We expect people to be responsible in our home. So in this scenario, we're gonna go with that. We've decided to be responsible in our home. So we're going to define that being responsible in this home means that we're gonna put our toys away after playing with them. Maybe that's what our toddlers are gonna do. So as the parent, I'm going to model this. So after I play with my toys, here's where they go. Here's the home where the toys live. I model that so that my child can see that. Then I encourage my child to practice that. So now you practice. What does it look like when we put our toys away? So maybe our child goes, puts the toys away. We wanna say, fantastic, you showed responsibility when you put your toys back where they belong after playing with them. So again, I just wanna repeat, we wanna define the behavior. Think about that as a family. Sit down and think about, maybe we wanna be responsible. What does that look like in our family? Maybe we wanna be respectful. What does that look like in our family? Once you decide on that, you wanna model the behaviors. We definitely want our children to see how we expect to behave, what that looks like, so that we're all on the same page. We wanna practice those behaviors repeatedly, constant, until we get those down. And then we wanna provide very clear feedback. When we think about informal teaching, it's every opportunity that provides us with a moment to teach the behaviors that we expect. Remember, no one knows your child like you know your child. So before running errands, begin with a pre-correction. Clearly explain the expected behavior. Hey, we're running to Target to pick up a prescription and some bathroom items. While we're there, you need to keep your hands in your own space. Keep your body near mine and stay focused on our needed items. Notice in my example, I didn't say don't touch things, do not walk away from me, what we know is when we state what we want from our children, what we want them to do, we're gonna get much further with their behaviors than telling them what we don't want them to do. Sometimes, kids aren't always gonna listen to what we have to say. So we need to calmly reteach behaviors. So if the expected behavior is to not touch things in the aisles, then we need to gently remind our child, hey, remember, our expectation is to keep our hands in our own space. Here's how that looks. And then, as soon as your child does that, you wanna praise them when they do it correctly. Hey, thank you for following that expectation of keeping your hands in your own space. As soon as you see them do that, follow through with that important feedback. So that important feedback is behavior specific, behavior specific praise. Here's the thing about behavior specific praise. We want it to be simple, we want it to be authentic, our kids know when we're not being true to ourselves, when we're just kind of making stuff up. So being sincere when we offer praise is gonna be really important in this area. 
We also want to praise effort, not ability. So when we think about, we want to focus on skill level. So for example, maybe, maybe your child has been working really hard at keeping their room clean. So you want to say that specifically. You've been working really hard on this. You've been trying to keep your room clean and you've done that so many days in a row. Finally, we want to think about how often we're offering praise. A good rule of thumb to follow is four positive statements to one negative statement. So let's think about that again. Four positive statements to one negative statement. We want to always catch our kids doing good. We've heard that before, caught being good. So when we constantly reaffirm what it is they're doing correctly, we're going to see that behavior more often. We're often asked in education, as people who support parents, why is it that I am rewarding behavior that should just be expected? Well, here's the deal. We want this behavior to become the norm. So we're gonna teach the kids our expected behavior. They're gonna do that expected behavior and we're gonna reinforce that with positive comments, with behavior specific praise. And then that behavior is gonna become the norm. And that allows us time to focus on another behavior that may need to be improved. So let's talk about behavior specific praise. We talked about that authenticity piece. We wanna make sure that when we're offering it, we get our child's attention. Okay, we want to get their attention, making eye contact, whatever feels comfortable and is the norm in your family. We want to label the specific behavior and then we want to follow that up with a praise statement. So here's how that might look. This slide provides examples of that. So you might have had one of your children help somebody else solve a problem. And so your praise is going to sound like, hey, you acted responsibly when you helped your brother find his shoes. What a great older sister. Maybe getting homework done, especially in this time, is difficult. So when your kids start their homework, follow up immediately with, thank you for starting your homework without being asked. You are so responsible. So again, I've stated specifically what the behavior is, what they did well, all while looking at them and providing authentic reinforcement. We talked about errands before, let's look at that one. When our kids are behaving appropriately during errands, we might say something as simple as, you followed directions, you stayed close to me, and you didn't ask for any items while at the store. Thank you for being respectful. I am proud of you. Nothing builds your child's self-esteem and positive behavior when they know that we are proud of what it is they're trying to do. So what we know is that BSP, behavior specific praise, reinforces our child's expected behavior. However, what we do, we, what we also know is that sometimes our kids don't always behave the way they want to be, we want them to behave. And so we need to think clearly about what is our child's behavior telling us. My colleague Tom is gonna explore that further as we move into the functions of behavior. Thank you, Anne Marie. I'm Tom Hankin. I'm also a PBIS coach in the district. Even though I'm going to be not going to be a parent until this spring, I have experience working with kids as an uncle, a coach, and a mentor. As Anne Marie said, behavior specific praise is a great strategy that helps our kids learn how to how we expect them to act. Now we're going to talk about what that behavior is telling us. Why are they acting this way? What are they trying to accomplish? When we understand what their behavior is telling us, we learn how to respond and how to teach them to ask for it in appropriate ways. Usually when we seek behavior, kids are trying to tell us something. They want to escape situations, tasks, or people, or they want to gain something, including our attention. They want our attention so they might yell and scream so that we stop what we're doing and we yell at them to stop and give them the attention they're asking for. Even though we did this in a negative way, they still got the access to the thing they wanted, which was our attention. My nephew has learned that he can ask for something repeatedly and knows that no matter how many times he's told no, that eventually he'll get a yes. He asked me to play a game on my phone. I tell him no, but yet he keeps asking. He's learned that adults eventually say yes, no matter how many times it, he, he asks. Kids do what works. Making a request 100 times work or request 100 times works for him because he knows a yes is coming. 
Kids do what works. The behavior works for them. In this example, they do not want to eat the food. They want it to be gone, and they want to be done with dinner, so they throw it on the floor. They're trying to escape those dreaded green beans. My nephew wants to play a game. He wants to gain access to something. He asks until I get tired of him asking or give in, or he engages in behavior so that I give him the game to stop the new, more disruptive behavior. I give him something else to do. He ends up getting what he wants. In both cases, there are more appropriate ways to gain or access to things they want. He, my nephew has learned, if he avoids the adult, annoys the adult enough, he will get what he wants just to keep him quiet. Reinforcement is not only about giving tangible rewards, but about giving access to, to or removing unwanted stimulus. On the last slide, we ended dinner by removing the plate, and we, forced the be we reinforced the behavior of throwing it on the floor and giving them what they wanted. Their behavior worked. They wanted dinner over and didn't want to eat their green beans. We are teaching them that that's appropriate, and that's how we want them to tell us they're done eating. Even though we are frustrated by the act and just want it to be over, we have to go back and have them do it the appropriate way and reinforce that behavior. It's important to reinforce what we want them to continue. Again, kids do what works. If crying and yelling stops working to get your attention, or if throwing the plate does not get them out of dinner, they will do, what some, they will do something else, do something that works for them now. I do not want to know if he's done with dinner when I hear a plate and food hitting the floor. When that happens, I have to put the plate back on the tray, show them the appropriate way to end dinner. When the plate is back on the tray, tell them to get our attention by saying, all done, please. And when they've done it the right way, I take the plate away and show them that's how they tell us they're done eating. In the case with my nephew, I don't want to have to answer no 100 times during our visit. I need to offer an alternative time or activity for him. I have to teach him that it's not appropriate to keep asking when I've said no. No, I mean no. Together, we work on a better plan. If he wants to play a game and I say no, he has learned to ask if there's a time later when he may play the game. If there is, we agree that he can play the game when it later when it's more appropriate. If not, we accept that and move on to something else. I have to make sure and grant his request at that later time though. And I have to remember that we agreed to that or it falls through. I can't backtrack. He is learning how to gain access to something he wants in a more effective way. I do that by reinforcing the behavior I want to see from him. Behaviors are a type of skill. Skills can be taught. Behavior can be taught too. When we use behavior-specific praise to point out what they're doing correctly, we can significantly change the behavior. The behavior will follow the reinforcement. All of this does come with a warning. When you try to change the behavior, we can expect it to get worse for a short time before it gets better. This is called the extinction burst. The extinction burst is the increase in frequency or intensity of the unwanted behavior as a response to our actions as we try to change their behavior. It worked before, and they think if they try harder, it'll work again. They think if they yelling gets your attention, they think if they yell louder and longer, they will get your attention again. Again, kids do what works. They have several experiences telling them that their behavior gets them what they want. My, my nephew has learned that he can keep making requests and eventually he gets a yes, no matter how many times he has to ask. Even though we worked on a new plan and get a better way to seek what he wants, he's likely to intensify his behavior. Instead of asking, he may increase other non-preferred behaviors so that he gets access to the game. He may increase other behaviors that are disruptive so they'll let him play the game so that he's quiet and less distracting. But don't fear, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We have to continue to stay true to what we are doing because it'll work. Now I'm going to throw it over to Scott, who's going to talk to you about establishing boundaries and consequences. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Tom, for throwing it over to me. My name is Dr. Scott Fluke. Um, like Angie said at the beginning of our conversation this evening, I'm the PBIS coordinator for Olathe Public Schools. I'm also a licensed psychologist, and I've had the privilege of working with students with significant challenging behavior for the better part of a decade. Um, I love these students, and I love that part of my job. It's just I'm one of those guys that really just enjoys working with, with, with that population. Um, but more, more important than any of that, I'm, I'm a parent, and that's relevant to our conversation this evening. Um, I have two twin 
twin two-year-olds, um, Toby and Ellie, that, that keep me busy. And we recently added a three-month-old um, to, uh, to the family as well. His name is Ian. So we have three under three, and that keeps my wife and I busy. And I'll tell you, I have learned way more from the last few years with the three of them than I ever did in my time going through school and working in, in the school district. Being a parent is different, and it's hard, and you make mistakes. And that's what I'm here to talk about is what happens when mistakes are made. Um, Anne-Marie and Tom spent a lot of time talking about some really, really important work around uh, prevention and teaching appropriate behaviors and understanding the why behind behavior, behind behavior management, um, how, to, how to turn positive behaviors into lifelong habits. And, and my friends, that's, that's what I want you to dedicate most of your time and energy to, what we've discussed so far. That's where the magic happens. That's where the most important work is done, when you teach and reinforce that behavior you want to see. But we don't have our heads in the sand. We know that no matter how, how good of a job you're doing as a parent, we're not perfect, and our kids aren't perfect, and mistakes are going to happen. We're going to need to be ready. So no matter how much prevention you have, you're going to have to be ready to, to, to uh, make a decision when things are not going well. And that's OK. Your job as a parent is to be prepared for when that happens. We want to we move away from treating it like a surprise when our kids engage in challenging behaviors, because we know they're going to. We know that it's going to happen eventually. What we want to move, uh, move towards is more of a strategic plan for what to do when they're not going to listen to you, what to do when they won't do what you say. And the next two sections that of this of our conversation are gonna are gonna discuss and help us to reflect on how to be ready when all of our prevention efforts do not work. First, please know that it is more than just okay to set boundaries. Kids need boundaries. They crave boundaries. That's the same as, as adults. We need and crave boundaries too. And effective parenting, really at its heart, what it is is, is a combination of high levels of love, lots of love, and setting healthy boundaries. We need love, we need boundaries. If we can do both of those things, then our kids are gonna grow up happy and healthy for the most part. The trick comes in setting those boundaries wisely. And that, that's easier said than done. Um, for example, my daughter Ellie, like I said, she's two, almost two and a half years old. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I had told her, please don't play on the stairs. So what does she do? She wants to figure out what I mean by that. She wants to understand when I say don't play on the stairs, where exactly is the line that daddy's going to draw? And so what does she do? She walks over to the stairs and she's watching me the whole time, right? She's, she's watching me, look at me right in the eyes and she's like, okay, where are you going to tell me to stop? I don't tell her to stop because she's just walking towards the stairs. Then she stands on the stairs. Okay, that's not playing on the stairs, so I don't say anything. Then she starts to jump on the stairs and that's where I'm like, okay, that's where I've decided that's the boundary. That counts as playing on the stairs. I told you not to do that. But you can see what her process is there, what she's trying to do. She's, she heard me when I said, don't play on the stairs. She wants to understand what I mean by that. And so she's going to test that boundary that I set in order to find out where it really is. And that's what our kids are doing so often when we see challenging behavior. They're testing boundaries in order to find those boundaries. She's not testing me. She's testing the boundaries that I set. And that's an example for a two-year-old, but you can see how this, how this really um, works just as well for, for older kids as well. So let's think about a, a, um, when my kids are older. Maybe they're 14 and I tell them, no internet in your room. Maybe that's a good idea, maybe that's a bad idea. That's for you as a parent to decide, but maybe I set that, that boundary that no internet in your room. So what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna test that boundary. Does a tablet count? Does a phone count? They'll try to bring those things in or they'll ask me questions and they'll try to figure out where that boundary is. Does Xbox Live count as internet in the room? They're going to test and test and test to try to figure out where that boundary is. And kids do that because boundaries and consistency, well, they make us feel safe, right? We want to understand where, where the barriers are, are where, where, how far we can push things. Um, and and, and uh, that really helps us to understand the world around us. And that's, again, the same, the same is true for kids as it is for adults. We all have that. That's something that's inherent in, our, in us as human beings, is we want to know where the boundaries are, and we try to test those boundaries to figure that out. Um, that consistency really helps people feel safe, and so when we set our boundaries, the real trick is setting a boundary in a place where you can, where you can maintain that consistency. Setting a boundary in a place where you can maintain that consistency. But that's much easier said than done. There's, there's some trick to it, and there's some, there's some practice that needs to be done before you really get fluent with that. It's a real skill that takes a lot of time to develop. But the way that you, that you get there, the way you really work towards that is what's in this bubble here. Say what you mean 
and mean what you say. Say what you mean and mean what you say. That goes for when you say something positive is going to happen, like, hey, if you look in the number seven, you're going to see that Santa left you something. If I say that to my kids, something better be there, right? But it also goes for negative things, too. If you play on the stairs, then you will have a timeout. What happens if I say that, but I don't follow through? Well, then my kids learn he doesn't mean what he says. So when he says that there's going to be a negative consequence, why should I trust him? Why should I believe him? And then that starts to spill over into other parts of our life too. When I say that we're going to go to the zoo next week, when I say that um, this is the way you need to handle that challenging situation, the, the pattern that I've established with them over the course of our years together shows them whether or not they can trust what I say. And that starts with saying what you mean and meaning what you say. So when you're giving these boundaries, when you're setting these boundaries, it is absolutely critical that you pick a line in the sand that you're ready to stand by. Never, never, never make an idle threat. Don't say you're going to ground them for life. Don't say you're going to turn this car around, around unless you really mean it, unless you're really truly in a position where you can follow through on that. So let's, let's, let's start to dive in a little deeper and think through what this can look like as you're setting these effective boundaries, as you're creating a consistent line in the, in the sand that you're ready to follow through on. This is a model that you can use um, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty easy to use um, when you're working with, with kids of all ages. Um, you can see the first bubble is, again, the most important thing, the prevention side of things. All that stuff that Anne-Marie and Tom were talking about, that's all in that prevention bubble. That's critical. Again, most of your time and energy and effort needs to be there if you're going to build lifelong habits for your kids. But again, sometimes that doesn't work out. So let's move over to the next bubble. Challenging behavior occurs. Okay, whatever that behavior is, maybe they took a soccer ball, maybe they stayed out after curfew, maybe they broke something, some sort of challenging behavior occurs. Okay, your first step after you see that happen, it's the green one in the middle. It says effective redirection. Effective redirection. I'll talk through exactly how to do that here in a moment, but basically what an effective redirection is, is you're telling them to stop something and then start something instead. Stop this, start that. Stop this, start that. When you give that redirection, your, your kid is going to do one of two things. They're either going to follow what you've now said or they're not going to. This is huge. If they now change their behavior for the better, if they now give the soccer ball back, if they climb down off the fence, if they've changed their behavior for the better, immediately jump in with that behavior-specific praise that we referenced earlier today immediately jump in with that behavior-specific praise. There is no better time to praise than when they change their behavior. And that's tough, because if, they're, if they were just misbehaving not too long ago, the grown-ups get emotional about that, right? We're, we're, we're kind of in, and maybe not in a great headspace, and we're not thinking we want to immediately give them praise when they were just climbing on the fence, when they were just late for curfew. But when they change their behavior, the best, that's the best time to give that praise. So that's my challenge to you is to look for that behavior change, that positive behavior change, and jump in with that behavior-specific praise. But what if even after the, re the redirection, they're still engaging in the, whatever the behavior is? Well, then we're ready to escalate it to a warning. So a warning is uh, um, basically you take that redirection, the stop this, start that, and now you're going to add one more component. If you continue, then this is what's going to happen. If you continue, then this is what's going to happen. And notice my language there and kind of the, the tone of my voice. On the previous slide, I, I failed to highlight the, but don't say it mean. And that's where this really gets huge. When you're giving these warnings, when you're working through this model, it's a business-like tone. It's just basically telling them what's going to happen. It's almost just informing them of what, this, what walking down this path is going to lead to. If you touch the stove, it's going to hurt. If you continue to play with the ball that's not yours, then I'm going to put your ball in the garage for a day. You just continue, you just have that business-like tone, just tell them exactly what's going to happen. No need for um, being disappointed or frustrated or angry. All of that just clouds your judgment in the moment, so we can leave that all, all aside for now. After the warning, if they change their behavior for the better, again, awesome, that's great, great job. Behavior-specific praise right then and right there. Jump in and label exactly what behavior you, wanted, you, you liked and tell them they did a good job. But if they still fail, if they, if they still fail to change their behavior, if they're still engaging in the challenging behavior, even after the warning, what do you do? Well, that's when we follow through. You can see how this entire model is set up to talk about meaning what you say and saying what you mean. Now we've put ourselves in a position where we're able to follow through really effectively. So you've just told them exactly what you want them to, to stop doing and start doing. That was the redirection. Then for the warning, you told them, if you continue, then this is what's going to happen. And now the follow through, you just follow through. 
you just actually do what you said they were going to do. After that consequence, whatever it is, then if they change their behavior, again, behavior-specific praise, even though that's an emotional moment. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit further and, and make sure that we understand the, the, the details of an effective redirection and an effective warning. So again, that effective redirection has two specific components. Stop this, start that. Stop this, start that. I need you to climb down off the fence and walk around. Please stop jumping on the stairs, walk down them. What we often forget as adults is we forget the start statement. And what that leads to, if you're constantly just focusing on what kids need to stop doing, stop doing, stop doing, that's basically like playing whack-a-mole. Because if you, if you tell someone to stop running, they're going to speed walk. If you tell them to stop speed walking, they're going to start skipping. And if you, what, you need to just tell them exactly what you want them to do instead, and then look for that change and provide that behavior-specific praise. So again, stop this, start that. And then an effective warning, all you're doing now is layering on that if you do not, then this is what's going to happen. So for example, if I'm working with an older, an older child, 17 years old, who's come home after curfew, I might say, it sounds like you really enjoyed getting to spend some extra time with your friends. I'm validating why they did what they did. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But the curfew we had agreed on is 10 p.m. Now again, business-like tone. Next time that you, go, that you go out, be home by 10. Stop this, start that. If you come home after 10 p.m., then, and then I say what the consequence will be, and I'll talk through that in a moment. You can see that, that whole piece, there's no emotionality, it's just business-like, this is what's going to happen. And then if they come home at, at 11.30 the next night, well, I'm ready to follow through because it's not gonna be a surprise when I then proceed to whatever that consequence is. So how do we pick good consequences? Well, that's not, not an easy thing to do. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, one of the most common questions I'm asked um, as, as a behavior person is, um, what consequence, consequence can I give that's gonna change the behavior? And, and the answer to that is there isn't one. There's not one. I can't tell you, well, take this away or do this instead or use this exact phrasing and it's all gonna get better. It just doesn't work that way. Again, the, the real way to build long-term positive habits is all the stuff in the first half of this, of this presentation the prevention, the teaching, the understanding the why. That's what really moves the needle. We still need to have this side of it. We still need to be ready for this side of it, but we change behavior with prevention, teaching, and reinforcement. But when it gets to this point, my biggest piece of advice is to create your menu of reasonable and logical consequences in advance. Create that menu in advance. Why? Again, when your kids are engaging in challenging behavior, they're screwing around at Target and they're all over the floor and throwing things out of the cart, that's an emotional moment for you. You're looking at the other adults in the area, you're seeing what, they're, what are they thinking about me and saying about me. What, maybe you're at home and you're with, with a spouse and what are they thinking about me, what are they saying about me? And then there's just that piece where my kid is just not listening to me and I've spent so much time and we have a, we've been dealing with this for five years now and we should really know better. That's just, in a, that's just an emotional moment. And in that emotional moment, that's where people are likely to say something that, um, that they're not able to follow through on. I'm gonna take that away and I'm not giving it back for a year, for example. Um, that puts you in a position to do one of two things. You can either follow through on that threat to take away something for a year, then you actually have to do that and that may not be remotely appropriate and that may be hard to follow, to, to stick with. Or two, you show your child that you don't mean what you say by actually giving it back before the year. So we prevent that by creating that menu of consequences in advance. Work with whoever is helping you raise this child, whether that's aunts or spouses or whoever, to create what that consistent, consistent consequence system is going to be. And then I would honestly just communicate that with the kids, whatever age they are in a way that they're going to understand. Communicate what the consequences are in advance so that they know. It doesn't need to be a surprise, and in fact, it's best when it's not. Of course, you're going to want to adjust those consequences to your child's very specific needs and abilities. So only you know your child and know what's going to be effective and not effective for them. Only you know what has not worked for the last 10 years and what may or may not work going forward. Um, but let me give you a few examples here of some consequences that I, I have found effective when working with families um, and some that I've even used myself um, that I think that you may find some value in when you're thinking about what can be on this menu of reasonable and logical consequences. Um, the first one is a classic one. It's, it's time out. Uh, most of us know what this is. Um, but when we really think about what, what actually is time out, what makes it work, you can think about time out very simply as removal from the fun stuff removal from the fun stuff. 
So if they're playing soccer, timeout would be you're no longer playing soccer. If they're um, playing playing catch with, with a friend, timeout would be you're no longer playing catch with that friend. Removal from that fun stuff. That's what timeout is. And it really is pretty effective. Um, kids, kids respond to it. Um, and I, this is what I do with my two-year-olds. It's an incredibly appropriate strategy for, for young kids. It's also appropriate as they get older too, but really, really effective for young kids. Um, you just want to think about some of the, um, how long you, you're going to do it for. The general advice is um, one minute for every uh, year old they are. So my two-year-olds, I'm aiming for about a two-minute timeout. Um, but there are also some some people that, that have, have done some research on this, and what they found is the first minute is for the kid. Within the first minute of timeout is when they figured out that you didn't like what, whatever you did. The rest of that time, that's for you as a grown-up. That's for you to feel like some justice has been served. So please know when you're using timeout, the first minute's for the child to change their behavior. The rest of that time, that's just for you as an adult to feel like justice has been served. So you can decide how long that's gonna be, but after the first minute, it's no longer really gonna have that much of an effect on their behavior. The next one is called job cards. Um, this is a really good one, especially as we move into um, uh, early teens and late teens. Um, this is to try to, to get away from um, grounding. Um, ground, there's nothing inherently wrong with grounding. It's just if you ground, ground someone for two weeks, that's just a lot for you to carry out and remember. Um, and, and what tends to happen is over time, um, kids kind of get out of the grounding because the parent gets tired of enforcing it. Um, so job cards are an antidote to that. Basically what you do is you create a little jar and you put some various chores that need to be done around the house but aren't routine chores. So things like cleaning the bathroom or polishing the silverware or things that you know don't need to happen but are nice to have done when they're done and then you just put those in the in the job jar and then when misbehavior happens then you teach your children that well the, what the consequence is is you're going to draw a card from the jar and you're grounded until you're grounded until you've completed that job card what that does is that puts the responsibility on the child not the grown-up to enforce that consequence because they could be grounded for six months if they're never going to clean the bathroom but if they go and do it right away then they're done so they can tantrum as long as they want to. That's their business. But the consequence stays until they engage in that job card. That works pretty darn well. Uh, the third one down, removing privileges. This is a classic one, and it, it, is, it is effective. Um, just think about what privileges you're removing. You want to pick privileges that are, again, reasonable and logical consequences of the, of the action. So um, my, uh, if I have an 18-year-old that breaks curfew and I want to remove a privilege, or we're going to remove something that's related to breaking that curfew. So maybe they don't get to drive my car for a while, or maybe um, there's some other restriction that's related to not coming back on time. But I'm not just going to arbit arbitrarily take away their cell phone because it had nothing to do with what, that, what, the, what the actual infraction was. Um, and then finally, restitution. Um, restitution, in a nutshell, is making it better. Um, so you can think about whatever the, the challenging behavior hurt or harmed, and the, the consequence then, beco then becomes you need to make it better. So maybe they broke something, well, then the restitution would be fix it. Maybe they damaged something beyond repair, well, then the restitution would be they need to do something to help pay for that, that object. Maybe the, um, the challenge in behavior led to somebody being um, emotionally hurt or made, they maybe um, felt really bad about themselves. So the restitution would be make that person feel better. I do this with my two-year-olds already, um, when they, and they, they get in trouble. Um, they, they pick on one another, and they break each other's toys, and they steal each other's, each other's stuff. Um, so the first thing I do is I do a one-minute timeout, and then I move into restitution, where um, initially what it looked like was I walked them through, like, when you did that, this made her feel this way. She felt sad. She felt mad. How can you make it better? And then I told them, you can make it better by giving a hug, saying I'm sorry, helping her rebuild her trains. Um, but now that I've done that several times, all I have to say is, how do you make it better? And they know. They know what I mean by that. And even at two years old, then they immediately go and they try to make it better. And that's what our consequences look like. Now, that's for two-year-olds, but the same concept still applies in late childhood, early adolescence, and even late adolescence as well. Um, so that, that's what I have for you on um, understanding effect, effective consequences. Um, next, what I'm going to turn you to is Tana, who's going to talk through what do you do when things just are not working, when you kind of get into that emotional rut and we need to pull ourselves out of a spiraling system? So I'll throw it to you, Tana. Thank you, Scott. My name is Tana Arnold. I'm a PBIS coach for the school district. I'm also a school counselor, a professional mental health counselor, and I'm coming to you today as a mom of a 16-month-old and an expecting mom of baby number two. 
I'm going to be talking with you today about what to do when things aren't working, or as we like to talk about it, as what to do when all your wits have ended. So far, my colleagues have been talking about a lot of the proactive things that we can do, those preventative measures. Scott talked on the consequences, but what we know is we're human and we're going to make errors. And sometimes we're going to fall back on old strategies that we've used and we're going to make mistakes. And so what are we going to do when that has happened? One of the worst feelings that we have is when we're feeling stuck, like we don't know what to do. This happens for parents a lot when our children have challenging behaviors, leaving us scratching our heads. I want to talk to you today about three steps that can help you feel unstuck. And while the majority of what I'm going to talk to you about today is about how to work on your relationship with your child, these steps are very positive and can be helpful for your all of your relationships. So as we go through the next few slides, we'll be focusing on our children, but I'll also be adding in tips on what this might look like with your other relationships, whether that be with a partner, a coworker, a sibling, or a parent. These three steps are pause, repair, and move forward. When we as the adults are experiencing big emotions, we are unable to model effective self-regulation skills for our children and can say things that we may regret later. When we are feeling this way, we need to pause. We need to ask for a break. We might say something like, I need a minute to collect myself. We might need to separate ourselves and say something like, we both need to take a moment to have this conversation later when we can be more productive. And then we need to breathe. We like to say in our line of work, we don't want to make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. And being able to breathe helps us slow down so that we don't do that. Once you're in a quiet place, I want you to take three big breaths and use this time to collect yourself. A good strategy that I like to recommend is a grounding exercise that can be very helpful. After you've taken your three big breaths, I want you to do five, I want you to name five things that you can see. So for me, when I'm doing this, oftentimes I will go and I'll sit in my bedroom. So I'll name five things that I can see. It might be my lamp, my TV, my dog, shoes on the floor, a basket of laundry that I need to put away. Then I list four things that I can touch. Again, that might be my comforter, the wood of my nightstand, the scratchiness of my jeans. Then. I name three things I can hear. That might be the TV in the living room. That could be my cat snoring on the couch, whatever those things may be. Then two things you can smell. Maybe I can still smell the cologne that my husband sprayed that morning in the bathroom, or I can smell ki uh, dinner cooking in the kitchen. And last thing, I want you to name one thing that you can taste. This grounding exercise regulates your emotions and focuses your thoughts, allowing you to think with your rational brain again. Our goal is to become calm enough to move to the next step. I told you I was going to be giving some tips on adult relationships. When we take this pause, I did want to take a moment and remind us that some of us need that pause and other of us that makes us feel very insecure. For example, in my relationship, I'm the one that needs the break. I get very overwhelmed and flooded and I have a hard time thinking and processing what's going on. Whereas my husband, because of his background, he needs that security of we're going to deal with this now, we're safe in our relationship, we're just going to stay with it until it's done. This dissonance caused a lot of issues in our relationship early on because we were not matched and we weren't able to communicate. Once we realized that this was part of the problem, we were able to come up with a strategy so that I could say, honey, I need a break. I'm feeling overwhelmed. We will come back to this at this later time. And we would state that later time. It might be, we'll talk about this again after dinner. We'll talk about this before bed. Or if it's already getting late, we'll say, we're gonna go to bed now. We'll talk about this before we leave for work. So having the strategy that we both felt comfortable in allowed me to take the break that I desperately needed and gave him the security so that he was able to know that we were okay and that we were going to come back to this and resolve it. After we've paused and taken our breath, the next thing we want to do is we wanna reflect and repair. In this step, we are modeling the behaviors we wanna see. We want our kids to be able to be mediators when they grow up, and these are two of the steps to do that. First that we need to do is reflect on what went wrong. Did you lose your temper? Were your expectations clear? 
or were you listening to understand? When we think about what we were in control of and how that might have influenced others, it gives us a good jumping off place for repairing. I wanna take a minute to just talk a little bit more about what I mean when I say listen to understand. We've all had lots of conversations in our lifetime, so you're thinking, how is this any different? What I want you to do is to challenge yourself to really hear what your child is saying and not listen so that you can respond back to them. There is a difference. If we're spending all of our time thinking, what am I going to say next? I'm missing out on all of the other cues that they are using to tell me how they're really thinking and feeling. So when I change the way I'm listening and I'm listening to really understand what they're saying. It's not about me and my reaction. It's about them and what they're telling me. It leads to a whole different type of conversation. So when we're reflecting, I really want you to practice that skill. Next, I want you guys to work on repairing your relationship. As the adult, you must take the lead in repairing the relationship. First, we do this by apologizing for our behavior and state what we hope to do in our behavior next time. Sweetie, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I, next time, I'm going to try to ask for a break before I lose it so that we can come back and come to a solution. Then I need to give them the opportunity to express their feelings. And parents, this is where it's really tough, without becoming defensive. We just need to listen. When they say, but you don't understand, don't say, but I. Say, I'm sorry you don't feel understood. Can you help me understand? And ask them more questions so that they can tell you what's going on with them. Next, I want you to try to meet them where they are. Do they need a break? Are they the ones who are becoming overwhelmed and you can see they're having a hard time expressing themselves? Maybe they need that assurance like my husband does, that yes, I still love you, we're here, we're going to work through this together. And some kids want to pretend like the incident never happened because they have a whole lot of negative emotion, embarrassment, shame about what is going on. I'm not saying forget about it, but I'm saying give them that space to move forward so that they feel like they can collect themselves without having it um, be front and center. Lastly, I want you to connect to bridge that gap. The key word here is connect. You can do this by suggesting an activity that you can do together. For my 16 month old, when I have lost it or you know I'm getting frustrated, we'll go and we'll do Play-Doh together. She's still learning, so she doesn't know that I'm really trying to bridge that gap, but she knows that after mommy yelled, I apologized and we went and we did something together. For some kids, this needs to be um, a simple touch, a touch on the shoulder, a pat on the leg, a pat on the back. My mom always would rub our hair and that was just her way. She wasn't really huggy, but it was a way for her to connect and bridge that gap. I also want you to remind them that, they're all, that you're always there. Ask them what they need to feel safe and secure. How can we fix this? How can we repair this? If you ask them, you might be surprised at the suggestions that they give you. The last point I wanna make here is sometimes we can't identify what caused our issue. We don't know where we went wrong. And that's okay. But what we have to do as parents is we always have to pick up the pieces. If your child has exploded, make sure we help put them back together and let them know we're ready to move on. The last step was move forward. Now moving forward is not about forgiving and forgetting. It's about teaching expectations and giving opportunities to practice them. Our children cannot learn to behave better if we do not allow them chances to gain autonomy in scaffolded situations. Now this doesn't mean that you have one conversation and they get to go and do um, whatever it is again. Let's say your teenager goes out, says they're gonna be home at 11, they come in at two and they've been drinking. The next weekend, you're not going to let them just go out and have free reign again. But what you might do is create a plan, and that's our first bullet point, we wanna create a plan for rebuilding that trust on how they can do little activities that are going to gain your trust. That might be they start by, they can go out for 30 minutes or they can go out for an hour, their curfew's now eight o'clock, their curfew's nine o'clock. Um, whatever they may be so that you guys feel, both feel safe and secure in that plan. This is our way of creating opportunities to gain that trust again. 
The next thing is we need to follow through with our plan. And this is where I see a lot of parents have a hard time because we remember so clearly that worry and anxiety that we had when our teenager didn't come home. So then we create this plan. We say, here are the ways that you're going to earn my trust back. But then when it comes time, we just can't. We can't let go of that hurt and that worry and we don't let them. By constantly bringing up those failures, we're not teaching them correct behaviors and it could potentially introduce shame and guilt. But if we use pre-corrections on what we do expect of them in these guided opportunities, we are giving them chances to build competence and autonomy. And lastly, I want to encourage parents to resist the urge to bring up those hold hurts. As much as we might want to, because to remind them of what it's done for us, that's not helping our, our children. So. When that is happening for you, remind yourself what we're actually trying to accomplish, and that is opportunities to earn our trust back and build their competence and autonomy. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Scott to wrap up our session tonight. All right, thank you, Tana. Um, I just wanted to summarize our conversation this evening. Um, first and most importantly, it's all about being proactive. So thinking back on what Anne-Marie was talking about, we really wanna teach our students what we, what we expect to see from them. And then thinking back, back to what Tom was talking about, all behavior is communication. So the message there is think about the why behind the behavior and help that, let that help you decide what to do next. And then my, my, my content talking about, sometimes we're all gonna struggle. Um, so plan ahead, expect to struggle sometimes, and think about what those consequences need to be in advance so that you can make them more effective. And then finally, Tana shared with us information on when you get stuck, how can you pause, reflect and repair, and finally move forward so that uh, everybody can work towards uh, being a little bit better tomorrow than we were today. And if you need additional support, um, we have a number of resources that we would love to share with you that you may find helpful. Um, if you're a reader, here are three books that I personally recommend for um, families that are interested in learning a little bit more about this content. Um, the first one is a book that I actually buy for, for my friends when they have kids. Um, it's called The Kasdan Method. And don't let the title fool you. It's, it's not just for defiant kids. This is for any family that's trying to work through something that's not going well. So if you have any sort of behavior you're struggling with, this book is a very practical how-to guide on how to work towards a, a positive and proactive solution, very similar to the content you've heard today. Um, the second book is by Dr. Phelan, 123 Magic. If you like what I had to say about the redirections, warnings, and follow-throughs, this is the book for you because that's what the 123 refers to as redirection, warning, follow-through. So if you like that sort of that sort of stuff, this is a great book that walks you into more de walks you through more detail on that. And finally, the uh, Everyday Parenting Toolkit, also by, by Dr. Kasdan. Really nice broad book for people that are interested in sort of an introduction to this stuff and understanding kind of how kids tick and how behavior works. Really easy and quick read. So I strongly recommend that one as well. And then if you need um, a little bit more specific support to your, to your situation, um, please know that we have lots of resources on our website that you may find beneficial. Um, something we barely touched on today is um, how trauma affects behavior, how mental health is the undercurrent for so much behavior. Um, we barely touched on that, but it really is critical. Um, and this, this uh, website has lots of links and resources that can help you understand what that, what that information is and what it means and how that affects how we, how we do business at home, but also uh, resources, how to, how to ask for professional help if that's needed. So um, Johnson County Mental Health is, for example, a link here in the top right under resources that you may find beneficial um, as you look for um, more of a therapeutic approach to um, addressing a serious issue. Um, but all of these links on this website will point you to information and resources that you may find valuable, including who to ask for help at school if you feel like there's challenging behavior at school that needs to be addressed. And with that, I just wanted to, again, thank you for your time and uh, dedicating part of your evening to, to our conversation tonight. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to email us at pbiscoaches at olathaschools.org. We love this stuff and we're, we're extremely um, eager to help. Um, and uh, as, as a district, we're not just invested in the behavioral success of our students at school, we really, we really wanna invest in the long-term success of all of our families. So if there's any way we can help you, please reach out. We would love to partner with you. Thank you for your time this evening. Have a good night.